his own country of origin. And I want to uh, go over that topic briefly. I don't claim to be exhaustive in what I tell you, uh, but it, whatever I say is some kind of indicative of uh, how influential he was amongst his colleagues in India. So, <clears throat> before we come to this uh, particular aspect, let us uh, very briefly examine how Chandra described himself. And what I have got here is from his own writing about himself. So, he says, after the early preparatory years, my scientific work has followed a certain pattern motivated principally by a quest after perspectives. This quest has consisted in my choosing a certain area which appears amenable to cultivation and compatible with my taste, abilities and temperament. And when after some years of study, I feel that I have accumulated a sufficient body of knowledge and achieved a view of my own, I have the urge to present my point of view ab initio in a coherent account with order, form and structure. We will see examples of this uh, as we go along. And if we examine <coughs> Chandra's life, there were seven periods uh, of this nature. Each period was devoted to a certain type of work that uh, absorbed him completely. Starting with first was stellar structure and uh, on the right hand side of the screen you see the cover of the book which came out of this. So, the book was an introduction to the study of stellar structure which has been used by many of us uh, learning astronomy. Then stellar dynamics followed in the early 40s, principles of stellar dynamics uh, which is shown next. The <coughs> third period around 1950 was the theory of radiative transfer which is shown here uh, in the on the right hand side followed by in 1960s, beginning of 60s was hydrodynamic and hydromagnetic instabilities and the book uh, shown on the right hand side. Then equilibrium and stability of ellipsoidal figures of equilibrium. This is 1968. <coughs> then a long period was spent on different aspects of general theory of relativity and out came this monograph, a very big book on the mathematical theory of black holes. <coughs> and uh, in his final period, uh, he was fascinated by Newton's Principia and he wrote this book, Newton's Principia for the common reader. He also lectured on this uh, particular work in, he came to India, he talked about it. Uh, he was impressed by the fact that when he tried to solve some of the new problems which Newton had handled by modern methods and then went back and compared how Newton had done the problem himself, he was impressed that the method used by Newton was the more attractive, prettier or imaginative. So, he used to point this out. So, <clears throat> now I have having described Chandra briefly to you, to you uh, uh, I now come to the other part, the Indian academia in the 20th century uh, with whom Chandra had interactions. So, we find that there are <clears throat> one can make a division historically as pre-independence and post-independence, that is 1947. So, <coughs> pre-independence 
India had main centers of research in universities and astrophysics was taught in physics departments of Allahabad University where you see uh, Meghnath Saha here uh, <coughs> uh, the person behind Saha's ionization equation as astrophysicists use it and in Delhi University there was Daulat Singh Kothari who followed Chandra in Cambridge in the 30s. In the mathematics department you find the development of relativity and cosmology and two major areas where in Calcutta University where N. R. Sen was leading the main effort and uh, in Banaras Hindu University was B. V. Narlikar uh, who was again cre uh, he uh, responsible for creating a field of a new kind of area in which many students to which many students were attracted. When you come to post independence and that is post 1947 you find that the emphasis on research shifted from the universities to autonomous research institutes. Uh, one could say that this certainly led to a boost in research aspects, but it was at a cost which I think many of us now regret that uh, the cream of uh, effort was transferred from universities to outside. So there was a kind of brain drain uh, from universities to outside. And <coughs> That one can say that today if you look at the astronomy astrophysics research uh, although universities do have people working but the major thrust uh, is found in Mumbai in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research then in Bangalore you have the Indian Institute of Astrophysics Raman Research Institute and Indian Institute of Science in Pune there is a national center for uh, radio astrophysics and Ayuka, uh, my own center. Uh, Allahabad, uh, sorry, Ahmedabad has physical research laboratory and Nainital, which used to have an observatory there earlier as Uttar Pradesh State Observatory, uh, it has been converted into an autonomous institution and it's uh, I do not exactly remember what uh, ARIES stands for, but A stands for Aryabhata who was the leading astronomer in the 5th century. So of all these uh, institutions that you see, the one which belongs to or has links with university sector is only the Ayoka in, in Pune. So let me now <coughs> come to the interaction part and I would like to begin with Chandra and uh, Saha, Meghnath Saha uh, and I would like to go back to uh, a meeting of the annual meeting of the Indian Science Congress in January 1930 and remember today happens to be the same meeting uh, which is taking place in, in this uh, city, Chennai, so it is a coincidence. So January 1930, uh, uh, Kameshwar Wali in his excellent biography of Chandra has described this particular encounter which I would like to read out to you. Uh, <coughs> this was before Chandra sailed for Cambridge. So it says here, a few months later, 2 to 8 January 1930, Chandra attended the Indian Science Congress Association meeting held in Allahabad and there uh, the host and the president of the physics section of the Congress was Meghnath Saha, the eminent Indian astrophysicist whose theory of ionization a decade earlier had unlocked the door to the interpretation of stellar spectra in terms of laboratory spectra of atoms of terrestrial elements providing information about the state of stellar atmospheres, their chemical composition, 
the density distribution of various elements and then about the most important physical parameter the temperature. Now, continuing uh, Wally's description, uh, <coughs> Chandra had learned all this, all of this from Eddington's book, The Internal Constitution of Stars, and was aware of the high esteem Eddington had accorded to Saha and of Saha's election to the Royal Society in 1927. But Chandra was not aware that Saha was acquainted with his own work, that is Chandra's work. So, when he met Saha at the Congress and introduced himself, he was pleasantly surprised by Saha's compliment on his paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. Saha said that it was very suggestive and that one of his students was working on ex extending Chandra's ideas. So, this kind of interaction had taken place on the day when the Science Congress was uh, going on. And he introduced Chandra to this student of uh, his, uh, who also seemed to know about his work. And he invited Chandra to his home for lunch with a small group of research workers, all older than Chandra. This, this small lunch, which he was invited to, turned later into a dinner invitation with such distinguished senior Indian scientists as J. C. Ghosh, D. M. Bose and J. N. Mukherjee. Uh, as it happens, this group photograph taken on another occasion, you see these circles, these are the people identified there. So, uh, <coughs> these were the important people of Indian science in those days. So, Saha persuaded Chandra to extend his stay in Allahabad so that he and his students could discuss more with him. Chandra, so young, did not expect to be treated almost as an equal by an internationally renowned scientist of Saha's stature. Now, uh, I find that when I read this description, I cannot help comparing the situation as would obtain today, if at an Indian Science Congress a number of scientists meet, what would they discuss? My feeling is they would be mostly discussing politics rather than science. Uh, I may be wrong, wrong hopefully, but that is what I fear. Now, <coughs> coming to Kothari, the other name I had given, uh, associated with Delhi University, Kothari was also influenced by Chandra's work on white dwarfs and therefore had studied about dense objects and he found that dense objects can be ionized uh, at high pressure instead of at high temperature. So, uh, this was a new way of looking at uh, a, a source of ionization in massive bodies which are highly dense. And Eddington himself was impressed by this work because his quotation I, I have given is, we only gradually came to realize that ionization could be produced by high pressure as well as high temperature. I think the first man to state this explicitly was D. S. Kothari. There, then there is also uh, a testimonial from uh, Arnold Sommerfeld. Uh, he says that it is noteworthy that the Indian D. S. Kothari has developed an audacious relationship between the old fashioned planets and the now discovered newest heavenly bodies, the white dwarfs. Clearly, the effect of Chandra's on that field. So, uh, that they simulate planetary matter by keeping low temperature and high pressure. And then the conclusion that cold body, a cold body cannot have radius more than that of planet Jupiter. This was some kind of limit that uh, Kothari had arrived at. <coughs> so, this was the part so far as astrophysics was concerned. Uh, I would like to come now to uh, the interaction with relativists. Uh, so, my father that was V. V. Narlikar was at uh, 
BHU, Banaras Hindu University. And he had a very bright student, which is, this is my father and that's his student, uh, obviously taken at different times of the year. So, <laughs> otherwise you will uh, mistake them. <coughs> so the uh, person, uh, the student was Vaidya, uh, PC Vaidya, uh, and his paper in current science, which is referred to below, uh, uh, the Vaidya solution in 1943 demonstrated that it is possible to use general relativity to describe a spherical object emitting energy in the form of radiation traveling with the speed of light. Normally with a Schwarzschild solution you have no radiation coming out of the spherical object. So Vaidya looked at a situation where you have a spherical star which is radiating light uh, which uh, carries energy. So how to describe the uh, general relativistic solution. So around that time, uh, that is in the 1940s or early 50s, uh, my father who had been in Cambridge and was Chandra's contemporary more or less, so knew him very well, he wrote a letter to Chandra to ask if general relativity will have solutions to offer for astrophysics whether he felt that relativists should indulge in uh, problems in the, uh, of astrophysical nature. And Chandra's reply was surprisingly no. He did not believe that situations relating to strong gravity would be found in astrophysics. And <clears throat> why did Chandra think so in the 40s and uh, 50s? Because as you know that for strong gravity, you have this parameter 2 gm over c square r, m is the mass and r is the radius of the object and c is the speed of light, should be of the order of 1. So uh, he did not feel, uh, certainly for white, white dwarfs this ratio was much less than 1. And one could argue that this can be achieved at modest ma masses provided the density is high and that modest densities provided the mass is high. So you could rewrite the relation in the form of this thing uh, involving mass and density. <coughs> I put c equal to 1 there. Now <coughs> this was, uh, as I mentioned before, the discovery of neutron stars and quasars. So when these objects, neutron stars and quasars came up um, uh, on the dish of uh, the astrophysicist, they showed that such objects may well exist in the universe and so a new subject relativistic astrophysics was born as you uh, know today. Uh, the uh, 1963 uh, symposium in Dallas was held uh, to bring together astrophysicists and relativists. Now Chandra's lack of belief in the impact of general relativity at that stage, in the early stage, matched in a sense, Eddington's disbelief that nature would permit black holes. You remember in the, uh, in the controversy between Chandra and Eddington, uh, Eddington felt that nature should not allow such objects as black holes, which without naming them as black holes. So <clears throat> in a somewhat similar way, one sees that Chandra also felt did not the strong gravitational field objects uh, may not exist. Now when <coughs> in Banaras University, Hindu University, the Vice Chancellor uh, was a very distinguished person, uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan, uh, who was a, also holding a chair in Oxford, Spalding uh, Professorship, and he was, he later became the President of India. Uh, uh, so he was a great uh, personality and he conveyed through my father uh, an offer to Chandra to head a new observatory which would be set up by the industrial house of the Birlas who were the donors uh, of the university in a big way. Uh, so they said that BHU could control that observatory and they would endow it provided Chandra can come as uh, head of the observatory. 
Now Chandra declined this invitation, this was conveyed to him because he was not sure that the academic environment at BHU would continue once its distinguished vice chancellor had left and his reservations were indeed borne out because what happened was after uh, Radhakrishnan left after, uh, when his term was over, the uh, new regime which set in uh, did not respect many of the academic traditions for which Banaras had been present, had been uh, well known in the 40s. So Chandra's uh, fears were uh, well founded as it turned out subsequently. Now there was another university which uh, featured well uh, on Chandra's interactive schedule. Uh, that was Osmania University in Hyderabad. And <coughs> one of the uh, scientists there, uh, Saleh Mohammad Aladdin, who, whom you should see here, the planting tree in Ayuka, he was one of our distinguished university visitors. So he has, uh, in, in a letter, uh, told me one, uh, exp uh, one of his experiences. Uh, which is the following. First of all, we have to know that Saleh Mohammad Aladdin at Osmania had been a graduate student at the University of Chicago. And in 1959, he had attended lectures by Chandra. He was not Chandra's student directly, but he had attended Chandra's lectures. And he writes in his letter, Professor Chandrasekhar used to emphasize that mathematical work should not only be correct, but should also be elegantly expressed. So this uh, uh, emphasis on elegance was there with him too, post in Osmania University. And he was called for an interview. So he turned up uh, on the date the interview was scheduled and he was put up in the guest house and told that in the afternoon, uh, af uh, after tea, there will be an interview and he can, he should come, he should be ready for that. So he was waiting and uh, <clears throat> then he came to know that Chandrasekhar was visiting Usmania the same day and the university top brass were all uh, showing him around the university and uh, the surroundings. So uh, there was nobody to uh, tell Aladdin what was happening and then <clears throat> Uh, after that, there was a tea arranged for Chandrasekhar by the university. At that point, he was, Aladdin was invited to join the tea. So Aladdin came and joined the tea. Uh, and after that, Chandrasekhar left and everybody left. So Aladdin said, uh, but I have come for the interview. What, what is happening? And he asked, the vice chancellor happened to be still there, so he asked what happened to my interview. So vice chancellor said, oh, you have been appointed. So, so, so without an interview, he was appointed. And he suspects that they asked Chandra uh, about his opinion of Aladdin and went by it. So this was a very good thing for the university because Osmania certainly gained by the school of uh, astronomy that Aladdin set up. He had a number of students and uh, his work on galaxy interactions was very well uh, received. But I again think that if today you look at the situation, uh, if the vice chancellor had taken such a bold step, somebody would have gone to the court of law and said this is uh, against the rule and the whole thing would have been put uh, in uh, limbo. So uh, those days were really better in a sense if you wanted to appoint a meritorious person, the vice chancellor had the power to do it. The other uh, distinguished astronomer at Osmania University was K.D. Abhyankar uh, and he was, uh, he also writes that uh, his work on radiative transfer was very much in influenced by Chandra's help and Chandra also apparently helped him uh, with uh, certain issues on telescope site which he was looking for for the new telescope at Osmania University. Then uh, I come to another 
type of interaction and ask this question, were there any Indian graduate students uh, to work with uh, Chandra? Now here I want to <coughs> share with you one personal experience that when I finished my uh, mathematical tripos at Cambridge, uh, my father wrote a letter to Chandra asking whether uh, I could come and uh, be his graduate student. So Chandra wrote saying, this was around 1960, Chandra wrote back saying that it so happened that around that time he was in the process of changing his subject. As I mentioned, he goes from one field to another. And so he did not feel that he should take a graduate student just at that stage when he himself was approaching a new subject. So it turned out that I did not pursue the possibility of joining him as a research student, but I was, I remained in Cambridge and was Fred Hoyle's uh, research student. But Chandra had two students from India uh, at later stage who got their PhD under him and these were one was Trehan, S.K. Trehan, who after um, he came back to India uh, getting his PhD under Chandrasekhar, he was in uh, Punjab University, Chandigarh. Uh, he is no longer alive today. And the second was a girl student, Bimla Bhuti, who is uh, a distinguished plasma physicist. Both of them were working on plasma uh, physics interests of Chandra. So <clears throat> this is what I mentioned that Rehan had joined Punjab University at Chandigarh and set up a school on theoretical hydrodynamics and plasma physics in the applied maths department. This was clearly Chandra's uh, inspiration. And Bimla Bhuti uh, <coughs> recalls uh, that since Chicago University required single author papers for a PhD thesis. She had no joint papers with Chandra. She was Chandra's student, but uh, so far as the publications were concerned, Chandra insisted that she should write her own papers because that was the university requirement. Chandra had, however, helped on various occasions and she recalls his traits as follows, how he was as a teacher and guide. So he was an extremely disciplined person and expected discipline around him. So that was one thing. Then without fail, he would visit the library and glance through the latest journals. He was extremely hardworking. However, he would find time for gardening, musical concerts, reading classical, classic novels and so on. So for literature and the arts. And he was particular about English grammar, that the English should be written correctly and nicely. He had a terrific memory. At a social gathering, he would narrate stories about his interactions with other scientists. Uh, and then she says, I found him very friendly and affectionate. So this was, uh, these were the only two students that Chandra had from India uh, as his PhD students. Coming now to another type of interaction uh, where Chandra's work influenced Indians, the work on sun and neutron stars uh, is another topic. Chandra's work on white dwarfs set the trend for stars made of degenerate matter and neutron stars were naturally uh, considered in the same light. So Chitre, SM Chitre and who was at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and V. Canuto uh, at uh, CCNY, New York University, uh, considered uh, equations of state for neutron dominated matter in a highly compressed form. And <coughs> they uh, came to the conclusion that a similar mass limit existed of the order of two solar masses for equilibrium of neutron stars. And what Chitre mentioned subsequent, uh, in, uh, recently when I contacted him uh, was that the stability of solar models was discussed by Chitre using Chandra's perturbation technique. 
the eigen frequencies so obtained were compared with the observed acoustic modes and the solar model can thus be made more precise to compare with the neutrino flux the in interest in solar models being very precise was the following that as you know the solar neutrino problem existed uh, and uh, i'm uh, and although it is now understood that it is solved there is still a lot needed to know about neutrinos as rashekran was telling me at t so <coughs> the solar model uh, had to be studied very very uh, critically to make sure that the astrophysicists had made no mistake in predicting the uh, neutrino flux and uh, this was done with the help of uh, chandra's technique of uh, acoustic modes uh, small oscillations the conclusion was that the reduced flux of neutrinos uh, cannot be explained because of any shortage on the part of the solar model but it has to do with neutrino physics it, the uh, reason lies in among the uh, various possibilities in particle physics then i <coughs> want to uh, mention another interesting episode relating to uh, padmanabhan who was uh, my student at tata institute and who had correspondence with chandrasekhar so this related to what is known as antonov instability uh, <coughs> this was uh, discovered by antonov in 1962 now when padmanabhan or paddy was uh, studying this he saw that chandra had discussed a similar situation back in 1939 much earlier and equations of stellar structure as written by him for an isothermal sphere reduced to a first order differential equation using variables u and v these are defined in certain way solutions are shown on a spiral curve uh, in the uv plane and paddy found that this parameter q uh, which is uh, is described here uh, r is radius e is the energy and m is the mass this q uh, <coughs> relates to antonov instability what the parameter has so <coughs> q equal to constant uh, are uh, straight lines in the uv plane if these lines meet there is antonov instability now uh, this is what paddy found uh, looking at the model and then he wanted to know whether chandra who had gone through the same path back in 1939 did he know this particular result and so he wrote a letter to chandra saying uh, uh, what is your uh, uh, recollection and uh, also met him directly when chandra happened to visit uh, mumbai bombay and paddy was uh, there but both the attempts uh, chandra would not uh, answer uh, yes or no but because what he said was that this problem no longer interests him uh, after 50 years later i mean once he has finished that subject it is closed book for him he won't go back and open the pages and see what he had said at, at that time so this is an uh, instance of chandra's really being very perfect in whatever rules he had set you would follow them exactly then <coughs> there there was also encounter with ramnath kausik uh, who was uh, director of indian institute of astrophysics for many years uh, after he left the tata institute of fundamental research and now he is in U U united states so uh, kausik recalls that at a radio interview a question was asked by him to uh, chandra because his student wanted this question to be asked so he said you are asking interviewing chandra so please ask this question so uh, how he, the question was how should one approach the study of physics through experiments or through a study of theoretical physics presumably uh, the student asked this question or prompted this question because the student was being harassed or instigated or whatever you say uh, to do some experiments and he wanted to be purely theoretician 
So he wanted somebody to support him. So uh, anyway, that, that is what Kausik uh, thinks. That's the reason he uh, was asked, uh, asked to ask the question. So what was Chandra's reply? Chandra replied that different students approach physics in their own unique ways. But what is important is that they dedicate themselves to academic life. Uh, and then he gives an example. It does not matter through which gate one enters a garden. Once you are in, you may wander enjoying a bloom here or a bough there. So he, he said that you should enjoy physics if you are doing physics. And it doesn't matter which way you do it. So it's a very nice reply. And uh, I like to tell it to some of my students uh, in the, if, if they come to me with such questions. <laughs> well, uh, Chandra gave a talk uh, at Ayuka, which was also, in a sense, interdisciplinary across arts and sciences. Uh, this was his fam famous talk, the series paintings of Claude Monet and the landscape of general relativity, where he drew parallels between the aesthetics of paintings and mathematical equations. So uh, the equations uh, which describe gravitational waves and the equations which describe uh, Kerr metric, uh, he found there were similarities uh, of a nature that you will find in different paintings of Claude Monet, the haystack paintings. So I, I do not know to what extent the typical audience at Ayuka understood what he was trying to say, but those who could understand appreciated that point of view. So now <coughs> I want to finish with my own uh, encounters with Chandra, which were uh, once in a while. So in <coughs> 1962, uh, I was uh, a graduate student and I had attended the GR3. At that time, I don't think they numbered the conferences, but it would be GR3, uh, General Relativity uh, International Conference in Warsaw. And while uh, we were all staying in, the, in a very magnificent country house, uh, with big garden, uh, since the breakfast was still to come and I had got up early, so I was taking a walk in the garden and there I met uh, a senior looking person uh, in dark grey suit uh, and uh, of Indian origin. So I, uh, here I said in my mor mor morning walk, I came across an Indian delegate neatly dressed in a dark suit and then he came and introduced himself to me, saying he's Chandrasekhar. Uh, so, of course, I introduced myself. And uh, I was a little surprised what was he doing there uh, in, uh, in the relativity meeting. So uh, he clearly saw uh, some puzzlement on my part. So he explained himself. He offered the explanation. He said that. Uh, uh, I am thinking of getting into general relativity as my next research area. Uh, as I am new to the subject, I decided to attend this conference so that I may assess for myself what are the interesting problems in this field. So the relativity meeting uh, traditionally has all different parallel sessions with different topics. So you get a big menu and uh, you can choose what you like. So he clearly decided to do that. And uh, uh, the, this picture, of course, is not taken at that time. But uh, uh, just when we, he came to Ayuka and, uh, to uh, dedicate uh, facilities. So uh, it was a uh, reply which a young man of over 50 gave uh, about changing his field. Normally, one talks of change of field at younger age, not at the age of 50 when people, many scientists feel that they have done enough research, they should do administration. So this, this was uh, uh, an, uh, a new uh, aspect. And uh, <clears throat> I want to finish with an uh, uh, experience which uh, I want to share with you. 
uh, when I was uh, attending that Dallas meeting on relativistic astrophysics, uh, I was asked by Chandra to come and visit him afterwards uh, in Chica in uh, Williams Bay. He was uh, in the Yerkes Observatory. And he said, you give a seminar on highlights of the uh, Dallas meeting, which was the first Texas meeting in 1963. So in 1964, January, I visited uh, Chandra. Uh, he gave me very precise instructions as to how, what train to take from Chicago, and he will meet that train, etc. Everything was there. So he met me at uh, Chicago, uh, at the Williams Bay, uh, railway uh, station and I got down. Then <clears throat> while he was driving me to a uh, place for lunch, uh, he said that you are giving a talk today, uh, so I should warn you that I am sometimes very critical of whatever the speaker says. And I can then interrupt and may appear aggressive, but it is not to be taken as a personal thing. It's just that I get carried away with, with my uh, aggression. And then he gave an example. He said that uh, the Cambridge physicist, uh, astrophysicist uh, R.A. Littleton had come to give a talk uh, in my uh, uh, seminar series. Uh, that's what Chandra said. He talked about uh, stability of ro rotating liquid masses, which is subject which Chandra was at that time interested in. So obviously he could interact much more. So he said that when Littleton started talking and uh, Chandra kept on interrupting, each time he would say, I am sorry, Professor Littleton, I don't know how you got this step, how you got that step. So it was clearly indicating, the way he was talking was clearly indicating that he did not trust the derivation. So at one stage, uh, Littleton got very fed up with this interruption, and he said, uh, Professor Chandrasekhar, uh, an elephant may trample a fly and say, how did you get there? So, so he said, that, that's what you are doing to me. <laughs> so Chandra told me all this, uh, in, in, uh, just to warn me. And, uh, uh, so I was prepared, and, but since I was not describing my own work, I was reporting on a conference, I was fairly neutral in terms of defending anything I said. But I, what happened was at one stage I uh, described Willie Fowler's talk in which he showed how the relativistic correction to massive objects, the equilibrium condition gets altered. And he, he had a binding energy curve which went down and then up again, which was different from the Newtonian gravity binding energy. And he was using that to uh, put certain limits on when a star is stable or not. So when I described all this, Ch Chandrasekhar said, uh, uh, but how can you describe something is stable or not without doing a stability analysis? You have to do small oscillations. Uh, had, did Fowler do that? I said, no, Fowler was, had not done that. He was just uh, showing the curve, and from that you can make out if you displace it slightly, it comes back or not. So he said, no, no, that is not good science. It, it must, one must do small oscillation. So I said, okay, uh, one should do. Uh, I was not being criticized, so I could be <laughs> a neutral. Uh, and then after two or three months, there was a paper in the FISREV letter by Chandra doing the small oscillation problem to his satisfaction and concluding something about the stability. So this was the personality that I had the good fortune to meet on several occasions. I wish I had greater interaction with him, and so I think would many Indian astrophysicists would have liked. But whatever we learn from him is uh, worth cherishing. Thank you very much. Do you want to? Yeah, if you, yeah. 
Thank you, Jayant. Um, it's a fantastic talk, inspiring one. I'm sure uh, many of you will have uh, several questions. First, I'll make a small statement. The talk, PDF file of the, the talk is actually available just outside the thing. We have printed it out. So any of you who want to have a copy, please take. Now, uh, it's available for questions. So, I just want to recall a small incident. In, uh, I was working in uh, University of Madras Theoretical Physics Department, where Govindarajan was a student and uh, Rajaji was a professor and so on. So Chandrasekhar chose to visit that active theoretical physics department when he came as a distinguished UGC professor. So he spent one week there. So my field is far away from astrophysics. So one day I ventured to ask him, Professor Chandrasekhar, what do you think about the existence of black holes? So he looked at me and said that, have you seen the backside of the moon? I said, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> then that ended my conversation with him. Yes. <laughs> It was in 1979 or 80, yeah, around that mm -hmm. time. But he gave some set of beautiful lectures, I remember attending. Yeah. Ah, is there any other? Yes. But by 79, 80, of course, Chandra had worked a lot on, uh, on, on this all black hole areas. <laughs> 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 no, no, I think he believed in it, I mean, very certainly, because, I, in fact, one of his students, uh, was his last student? Uh, yeah, last student, John Friedman, who, with whom he worked on stability and so on, went to MIT to give some talks, and people there, particularly Philip Morrison and so on, didn't believe in black holes, and when he came back and told this, I mean, Chandra was totally horrified, so. So, uh, I mean, the Is there anything else? Okay. I will conclude with one more remark, which is he, yes. left, he brought me in. <laughs> so at the same time, when I was a graduate student, I did ask him another question. And that was, why is it so difficult to quantize gravity? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, of course, he has his own thought. Everything is probably he had a deeper understanding. But after three minutes of silence, said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that was his time. <laughs> I could never forget that. Okay. Now, there will be tea, snacks, everything will be available just outside. And we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.